So hi everyone, welcome to the next talk in our Black History Month series and beyond. Um, this book was not meant for us, a fresh look at the history of Mary Prince will be presented by Ifemu Amari Weber. Ifemu is a PhD candidate at the University of Wolverhampton and her research looks at the supplementary writing in the slave narrative, the history of Mary Prince 1831, as well as the 19th century public response to the book. If you have any questions, please use the Q&A box and we'll go through them at the end of the talk. Um, and just a bit of housekeeping before we do start, a reminder that this event is being recorded. It is a public platform, so please don't show any private or sensitive information. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Ifemu Amari Weber. Um, I hope we're going to have an exhilarating chat. Um, my background is a, a mixture of uh, the creative arts, teaching, working in the criminal justice system, and my journey has brought me to this place where I'm very excited about doing a PhD on Mary Prince, um, who I found out about 10 years ago. The exciting thing about doing a PhD is that you have to focus on, a, you know, focus on a, a topic very closely. But my experience is that other things happen, other dynamics happen um, that I can't write about in the PhD because it's very focused. And one of the aspects for me is about um, the kind of lack of history or uh, not formalized history um, for folks from the African diaspora and the African Caribbean diaspora. And that when information or new knowledge hits um, the, the public space, everybody gets very excited. And one of the pieces of new knowledge is about this person called Mary Prince. So what I was exploring the other day was the issue of her work, and she was not a writer, she was basically illiterate or semi-literate, um, has now come into the public space. But as far as I can read and reading in between the lines, Mary Prince did not see herself as a slave by the time the work was written. So the work was constructed and written for a different public, not a 21st century public, a, a 19th century public to end slavery. And so my question, and it is still an open question, is if the text wasn't written for the contemporary 21st century um, reader audience, and it was the slave narratives were essentially a tool for a 19th century audience. How are we meant to read uh, Mary Prince, the history of Mary Prince? Because basically this book was not meant for us. It wasn't written for us um, in mind. And that's what I want to explore tonight. So I'll go through a few slides and a few notes, and I am hoping that we can take it from there with, with an interactive conversation, because I love when we have um, when we publicly engage and have two two way dialogue with the public at least um, to look at our understanding as scholars and what is the public's general understanding in terms of the information that we are researching and sharing. So, so Mary Prince was born into slavery in Bermuda in 1788. And by the time she arrived in England in 1829, she had been sold a number of times over. So she had been sold and toiled as an enslaved person for at least five enslavers as we know, because we can only understand what the information that we've been given. So as far as we know, it's five enslavers. Both Mary Prince's parents were enslaved by different um, enslavers, different slave masters. So Mary was from birth still, sorry, Mary Prince from birth was sold from her mother um, 
and was sold to a Captain Williams who get, gifted Mary to his granddaughter as a pet and um, a, a, a playmate. So Mary Prince was sold to Captain Williams, who, so, who, who Mary Prince spent a number of years with his grandchild, Betsy. And then she was sold to a Captain I in 1805, and then to a Captain D in 1810, and then to John Adams Wood. We don't know the names officially of Captain I and Captain D, um, because those names were officially protected in the 19th century. So she was taken by John Adams Wood um, from Bermuda um, to Antigua, where she stayed. Uh, she stayed with that family for about 12 years. And then later on, she was taken by the Woods family to England, where she worked in their London residence as a washerwoman. Mary walked out of the Woods residence because she claimed she was being treated as badly as she had been treated when she lived in Antigua. So slave-like treatment, if you will. So she walked out of the woods um, resident and she knew that while she was on in, in, uh, English territory, while she was on English land, she was not enslaved. She was not formally a slave. So she walked out and she caught the attention of George Stephen and um, Thomas Pringle, the secretary, Thomas Pringle was the secretary of the anti-slavery trade, uh, anti-slavery society, and George Stephen was one of um, their legal representatives. So the anti-slavery advocates who knew that while Mary remained, uh, remained um, in England, she was free, but if she returned, she would be re-enslaved, tried their best to buy Mary's legal freedom from John Adams Wood in order to make her free. But Wood, he was truculent in his refusal and he actually went back. He delayed and delayed and delayed making promises that he may sell her or he may not sell her. And he went back to Antigua without Mary Prince. So in a way she was in exile. So Thomas Pringle later hired her as his own domestic in his own home in Solid Place in London for about 11 months or so in 1829. And while she stayed with him and his wife, uh, Margaret Pringle, at their home, she told her story to a Susanna Strickland, a budding writer at the time who was always also staying at the Pringles home at the same time. So how do we know this? We know this because we can read it in the book. There's now a book called The History of Mary Prince, a West Indian slave as related by herself with a supplement by the editor to which is added the narrative of Asa Asa, a captured African. So later on, I'll, I'll go into the dynamics of how the book was, was created, but in 1987, so we're fast forwarding now about 156 years, the book was rediscovered by uh, Maury Ferguson, uh, uh, an academic, and there was a lot of excitement and the excitement, can't, I cannot overstate the excitement with scholars and African Caribbean peoples in the diaspora. Because what we are very aware of as scholars is that whereas America has 6,000 published slave narratives, Britain has roughly six. And we know them to be um, Sancho in 1782, Corbana Cuba, in 1787, Equiano in 1788, he's the most famous one. And then there's Ashton Warner in 1831 and Mary Prince in 1831 and Asa Asa in 1831. And interestingly, all those 1831 publications comes through Thomas Pringle and Susanna Strickland. 
So my particular interest in Mary Prince's book is actually the paratextual materials that exist in the book. And the paratextuals as, 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 a, as a technique has nothing to do with slavery itself, but I will explain. So in 1997, Gerard Jeanette published a book called The Paratextual Thresholds of Interpretation. And he explains that editors have a lot of power in how they construct books, because in a way the editor is subliminally guiding the reader as to how a book should be read and what the book represents. Jeanette discusses this at length and putting it simply, the paratextual of a book is everything else outside the book. So, and that still exists today. I mean, we, we, we still have it within any book today. So what we have, you have the core text, which say it's a novel, it's a story. And outside of the text, which could be the book cover, the introduction, the epilogues, the epigraph, anything else outside of the text, that core text is known as a paratextual, is, is known as a paratextual. I will be looking at the paratextual in relation to the peritextual, which is inside of the book. The epitextual is anything outside of the book, i.e. Uh, newspaper responses to the text, uh, letters about the book and so forth. So how does this have a bearing on the history of Mary Prince? Well, what my research does is investigate how Thomas Pringle created, this, created his his peritextuals, which is his footnotes, his introductions, um, his commentary, a set of letters to try and shape Mary Prince into this Christian woman. And the argument would be this Christian woman, albeit a black woman, has been enslaved and using Mary Prince's story to show that slavery was bad, to so show that slavery should be ended now. We need to bear in mind and remember that the trade of uh, the slave trade ended in 1807, but having slaves still continued until 1834. A lot of scholars early on in the 90s and the, the, the very early part of 2000 got very irritated by Pringle because people like Rachel Banner and um, Barbara Baumgartner complained vociferously that Pringle in the way he created his own writing around Mary Prince's work and published it with Mary Prince's work in a lot of scholars views that silenced Mary Prince we, we don't really hear her voice. Everything is tailored to this anti-slavery discourse. So the composition of the book, as the title suggests, is in three parts. First, there is Mary Prince's actual story, as we are told in the title, The History of Mary Prince, a West Indian slave as related by herself. As you can see on the top right of your screen, one of the original book covers. Then there's a second part of the book, which is, and Mary, Mary's book is 23 pages long. It is only recently that we've called it a book. Before that, 19th century called it a tract or a pamphlet. So then we have the second part of um, this, this, this text, which is Thomas Pringle's additional commentary. And as you can see there, it said with a supplement by the editor, and that is 16 pages long. And then to end the, the, the text, there is a narrative of Louis Asa Asa, um, a captured African. And, there, and that work, which 
was again related. This person didn't write their story. Uh, Louis Asser told his story and that was published in um, the text as well. So as a 19th century reader, if you look on the top, uh, on the top right of your screen, we can see how just by reading the, the book cover, you know what you're going to be looking for. You're going to be looking for a West Indian slave story. She hasn't told it, it has been related. Um, she has told the story to other people. And then at the very bottom before the publication, we have an epigraph and the epigraph was um, a short, what Thomas Pringle did was lifted a, um, from a very long poem called The Negro Complaint, um, two verses and which he then put onto um, the history of Mary Prince. And it says, added to, and it says, by our blood in Africa wasting, ere our necks received the chain by the miseries that we tasted crossing in your barks the main by our suffering since ye brought us to the man degrading mark all sustained by patience taught us only by a broken heart and in that respect any 19th century reader would have understood that Mary, that, 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 that this is a, a poem told by, in the first person, from a first person's um, position as a slave. And that, that again, this the same message coming across that slavery should be ended. Okay, so what were the core features of the slave narrative, which, with only discussing one today, which is Mary Prince's slave narrative. And there are roughly six. They are the realization of being a slave, the brutality and the sense of loss, which is usually when, when enslaved people were ripped from their families and sold away from their families, conversion to Christianity, and reading, which is re usually reading the reading of the Bible, and dignity and home. Now, dignity and home is a kind of um, symbolic sense of the enslaved person, similar to Mary Prince, having a sense of her own personhood, no longer a slave. It doesn't mean physically, it doesn't mean physically going home. So these core features, all of these features are in. Um, the history of Mary Prince. The realization of being a slave, some folks feel that that is really strange. Why didn't she know she was a slave from the very beginning? Well, if you remember, she was given as a pet, as a, as, as a playmate to Betsy Williams. So for a few years, she was, she was just, in fact, in the narrative, it said it was the happiest time of her life because there was no brutality. There was no abuse as far as we know. And it's only when she is sold, um, roughly at the age of 12, that the brutality begins. So the slave narratives started, um, were initiated, uh, created in, um, in America in, 17, in the 1750s. And they were proven to be a popular tool to argue against slavery. It was a first hand account from enslaved people, usually ex-slaves, usually ex-slaves um, of, of, of um, brutality and, and bondage. And the purpose of the slave narratives, and that never shifted, was to enlighten white readers, particularly those with power, about the realities of slavery as an institution, and to reassure these readers as well that black people had some kind of humanity, oh, black people had humanity, just like anybody else, deserving of human rights. In other words, that black people were people, African people were people. Why is this necessary? Because there was a lot of literature that argued almost about the bestiality, the non-persona, of black people. So the British copied 
this overall style from the Americans are about the slave narrative using white folks, using white people to create um, statements and introductions to confirm that what was in the text, what was in the narrative was true. It wasn't a lie. In other words, these paratextuals function as an authoritative white verification. White folks had to rubber stamp this and say, this is true. So a lot of slave narratives are, are, are prefaced by white folks for that reason. So James Olney, um, his work, I was born, this is the title of his paper, I was, I was born, slave narratives, their status as autobiography and literature. He emphasizes that the elements of, um, in Mary Prince's book, shaped her persona into being a slave. We couldn't get rid of the idea that we now see Mary Prince as a slave and nothing else. So when we factor in 26 footnotes that Pringle writes explaining Mary Prince's plight, and when we factor in his evidence in um, the preface that nothing has been exaggerated and no facts of importance have been left out. And when we factor in, and these are all what we call paratextuals, when we factor in um, the letter written by uh, Margaret Pringle saying Mary Prince's back is checkered by scars and it must have been scars welting all over her body, wielding by some unmerciful instrument. We, we get that very um, sharp image of slavery, of the body, the body of the, the enslaved being abused. Here we have on your screen, I think you can see it on your screen. Um, the, in fact, one moment. Right. Um, Susanna Strickland and um, Thomas Pringle. Susanna Strickland is an interesting um, character because very shortly after um, she wrote, uh, she, she, she dictated and wrote down Mary Prince's story. She then um, wrote down another story, Ashton Warner in 1831. And by 1834, she gets married and uh, moves to Canada. Um, and she's quite famous in Canada as, as, uh, as a writer. I think the Canadians um, embraced her as Canadian. I mean, she died in, in Canada in about 1854. But so just to go back, so these, these two characters, uh, Pringle and Strickland, were the ones who edited and I would say dictated what was put in to Mary Prince's narrative. So we, we constantly question and are trying to find her voice. So another reason why white editors were deemed necessary was the fact that ironically, a lot of even liberal white folks in the 19th century did not believe the stories that we were being told about the brutality of slavery. And when we look at some of the instruments that were constructed to punish enslaved peoples, um, it does beg a belief. And I would say that Britain was in an interesting position compared to her cousin, America, in that enslavement or the, 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 the slaving of people happened away from Britain, happened in the West Indies, as it was then called. So a lot of liberal white folks still thought that the stories that were coming across from missionaries and 
um, other travellers were, were exaggerated. And I'll read a text, a bit of um, Mary, not Mary, um, Susanna Strickland's te uh, testimony about this. And she says, in 1831, as late as 1831, she says, and when I occasionally heard through other channels statements of cruelty and oppression which prevail in our slave colonies, I was predisposed to regard such statements generally as very greatly exaggerated at least, if not in some cases absolutely fabricated for political purposes. She adds, such tales appeared far too shocking to be true and without troubling myself to examine carefully into the real facts, I condemn the whole stories that I heard as matter, matters of party agitation. In other words, Susanna Strickland thought this whole thing was fabricated and she was, she was one of the liberal ones. And when you look at her writing much later on, you can see that it is the influence of Mary Prince and Ashton Warner telling their story directly to her that, 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 that changes her mind and that, 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 that reveals to her that these stories are far from exaggerated. In fact, Mary Prince leaves out a lot of stories. And so I would say the stories that are in her text are some of the are not exaggerated, uh, are, are undersold, if you like. So also all of our, uh, call them white editors, were at pains to emphasize the intelligence of the black people who had related their stories like Mary Prince. So for example, Pringle regularly in his work talks about, he mentions that. Mary Prince is remarkable for her intelligence and indeed always appears to me to be a slave of superior intelligence and respectability. So he, he, he has to, because his audience is a white middle-class audience, so it's striking how consistently Pringle has to emphasize the intelligence of this woman. And you can see that he, that he is, also surprised by her intelligence. So that slide with the, um, the, the hanging woman on the, on the tree is emphasizing this, the kind of image, the very physical image that, that, that pervaded slavery that shaped our concept that in those days, enslaved people were diminutive, they were helpless. I am not denying the brutality, but because the slave narratives focuses only on the brutality, we are, we are at risk of reducing these people to, to, to just that label. So, In so doing, let me just get my notes here. The vocabulary that is used in the book, as I said, reduces Mary Prince just to this archetypal black female slave. In her own, in, in the 23 pages that she writes, that, that she, she doesn't write, that she, she relates, the words flogging, beating, lick, 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 are mentioned roughly 54 times in, in, the, in the 23 pages. And for example, the word lit lit lick is, is um, a Creole register. And she, 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 she says, lit lit lick, I have seen their flesh, because she talks about other enslaved people. I have seen their flesh ragged and raw with lick and lick and lick. They were never secure one moment from a blow. So enslaved, this, this story of enslaved peoples is known by, by the time her book is published, it's known by, the story is known, well known over England, not, not Mary Prince's story, the story of enslavement. So, but there are three aspects of the book that I 
would argue makes this book very different because the question for us is if we were on the brink of legally um, ending slavery, why was Mary Prince's book necessary? Did it really have that kind of impact? And there are, there, there are a number of reasons. Firstly, my argument is that Mary Prince's story is told in present time. She includes story, she includes the treatments. So she's here in 1828. The book is published in 1820, 1831. And she talks about the, the, the brutality that she experiences from Wood. So it's, it's not a once upon a time past story. It's, it's a present time story. There are also five uh, correspondence, five letters that are integrated into Pringle's additional notes, and they're written by people between the eight, the, the between 1828 and 1831. And there are also explicit images of violence. There are hints of sexual violence. So strikingly, Mary Prince is a black woman who is living in London at the publication, at the time her book is published. I cannot emphasize that enough. She is also, um, the shadow of slavery still hovers over Prince, over Mary Prince, because if she goes back to Antigua, she is re-enslaved by John Adam Wood. And Mary Prince does not see herself at this time as a slave. She says, I have been a slave. I know what a slave feels. But yet in reality, she's still um, under uh, the, the prospect of being re-enslaved. So there are lots of gory details in the book of her, of, of her being whipped and hung up, just like the image you saw whipped and hung, uh, left for hours, and so forth. But there are, there's other information about Mary Prince that that's what I call the kind of quiet information. There's a romantic story about her husband. And in the text, Mary's sexual relationships, often with white men, prior to her marriage to Daniel James, a colored man, and I use that term because that is a term that is used in the text, and I will explain that. If I forget somebody, please ask me to explain why this is important, a colored man. Um, Mary Prince's sexual relations is, is, is literally wiped out and not talked about in the book. Actually, it comes out in a court case that, that you know, she had relationships with white men and so forth because the anti-slavery society uh, through Thomas Pringle and um, Susanna Strickland are trying to make Mary Prince as, to put it crudely, as near possible a white middle-class woman as you can get. And it involves being a good Christian, being an obedient wife, and um, just having a sense of propriety. So Mary Prince tells this story about how she met um, Daniel James. And she says, sometime after I began to attend the Moravian church, I met with David James, afterwards my husband and a widower. So there's this kind of respectability there. Yes, so she's met him in church. Um, He's going to be her husband, he's not her husband yet, and he's a widower. So his this kind of respectability threads through this little, um, this little vignette of a story. He had purchased his freedom of his mistress. Again, we get this sense of this man being industrious. He saved up money and purchased his own freedom. And when he asked me to marry him, I took time to consider the matter over with myself and would not say yes till he went to church with me and joined the Moravians. We were joined in marriage 
about Christmas time, 1826, at the Moravian Chapel, Spring Gardens, and we could not be married because we could not be married in an English church. And because English marriage is not allowed to slaves and no free man, he's a free man note, no free man can marry a slave woman. The picture, the pretty picture you can see um, in, uh, on the slide is actually um, the, a Moravian church in Spring Gardens in, in the actual land where the old church was, where Mary Prince got married. So there's still a church there, but it's not that church, but it's quite exciting to have been in the same, on the same kind of land as, as Mary Prince. But I want to draw you back to this romantic story of conversion to Christianity and marrying at Christmas in 1826 after a period of courtship. Because I would argue what Mary Prince is doing or what Strickland is doing or what Pringle is doing more often than not because she was telling her story to Susanna Strickland, it would be Susanna Strickland, is putting Mary Prince into this ideological space that is occupied by middle-class British women. So when somebody, women are reading the book, there's, this woman is not different from us. The only thing is she's enslaved and she's black. So this, 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 this narrative, this slave narrative is, is very, we call it spin today. It's very craftily. There's a, there's a pun there with craftily sneakily but there's a it, it's well crafted to create this image of of mary prince but through diligent scholarship from scholars like um jenny sharp and sue thomas we know that factually the, the chronology is wrong um this account of uh christian what she did convert to christianity in 1817 but this kind of being a member of the Moravian church for seven years and so forth, it, it doesn't add up when, as um, Professor Sue Thomas did, just looked at the archival material and made sense of the fact that she couldn't have um, married, she couldn't have been in the church for seven years and then, uh, sorry, let me start again. She couldn't have ended a relationship with Captain A, who turns out to be, um, a white man who then was was imprisoned for commit for murdering someone. Um, she couldn't have ended that relationship with him and then been in the Moravian um, church for seven years and then met Daniel um, James. When we look at the detail, this this it happened within months at a time. It happened within months that she had married. Um, Daniel James after leaving um, Captain Abbott. And when we look at the detail again, um, Mary Prince is very shrewd because of the choices she makes in sexual relationships and, well, maybe it was romantic, but sexual relationships because every um man that is cited or that we know of um in the archives was either a free man a white man or a colored man and if you step back let's not be, uh, and just move away from the kind of romantic anecdote you can see that mary prince is working is using the, 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 the resources that she has, saving money and so forth, and marrying a free man or liaising with a white man is another step towards, another strategy towards achieving her freedom. So I would argue that even marrying um, Daniel James, a colored man, um, sometimes he's described as a black man, um, other times, oftentimes he's a colored man. Um, that was another way of pushing towards, it was like she was marrying up, the fancy term called hypergamy, um, marrying up, marrying up, marrying out and, and trying to shift her status um, from an enslaved person. Um, 
because she tried a number of times when she saved money in Antigua to buy herself, to buy her freedom, and, and John Adams would again refuse. So this, this notion of um, the romanticism, uh, church marriages were, um, church marriages of enslaved people was forbidden. Um, just lost my train of thought there. Enslaved people weren't meant, weren't allowed to marry, weren't allowed to marry. This is Antigua legally free men. Yet Mary Prince married Daniel James behind, um, behind John Adams Woods back. I'm having trouble with my, um, I'm having trouble with my notes here. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Yeah. So again, the thing to look at is, is, is Mary Prince, you know, she is, she is wily, she is a strategist, everything moves towards trying um, to get her freedom. So she saves money, she um, cavorts with men who, who can buy her her freedom, and she gets married behind um, John Adams Wood's back. And when he finds out that she's got married, um, you know, she, she again, in the text, she, 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 she suffers for it because she, she's actually beaten again, encouraged ironically, or maybe not so ironically, by um, Mrs. Wood when she finds out that Mary Prince has, 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 has got married. So I am having trouble with my slides here. Okay. So what I'm arguing is that we need to read Mary Prince very carefully, very, very carefully, and not at its face value because it was meant for a different time and a specific purpose. We also need to read her not as a slave and how she wanted to be seen and how she tried to lead her own life. Um, as I said earlier, she said she's, 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 she is not a slave. There are a number of um, misinformation now, particularly on the internet, that um, Mary Prince toured um, Parliament, Mary Prince did speeches, Mary Prince had children, Mary Prince died at a particular point in time, uh, Mary Prince died in a, a specific time, is named 1845, I think it was that I read recently that she died. But what I'm saying to us is there's no need for us to layer any kind of heroicism onto this woman. She is no Mary Seacole, she's no Sojourner Sir Sir Truth. But that said, she has the wildness and resilience that would, that would, that, that would put her in the bracket of a Sojourner Sir Truth or, or a Mary Seacole, because her hurdles are just as tough. She cannot read. Um, she can barely read, she can barely write. She is suffering from her wounds. She's going blind in one eye. So what I'm arguing for is that we read and see Mary Prince as that kind of person, a person with resilience, a person who gathers knowledge in a different way. A number of years after Mary Prince um, was, was taken, she, she, she literally bumps into her mother and she, her mother has gone what we used to call insane. Her mother doesn't recognize her. Her mother has lost her senses. And it always reminds me of a Tony Morrison, um, part of beloved Tony Morrison story, but she says, my mother 
When they said my mother was here, I thought there was in jest, but she did not know me. Mummy, what's the matter? She had began to talk foolishly and said that she'd been on the, the bottom of a vessel. They had been taken by a violent storm at sea and my poor mother had never been on the sea before and she was so ill, I think she'd lost her senses. And again, this comes up in a, a, few, a few lines in Mary's story and there's a very slim footnote from, Mary, from Thomas Pringle saying, well, um, from that time, Mary didn't see her mother again. The idea of Mary being estranged from her mother and then seeing her mother in what, what we call now insane, not even recognizing her, is not given any great um, space in the history of Mary Prince because that does not feed into what the anti-abolitionists want. They are interested in this person and um, and her slave story, not actually what is happening to her mentally, but that kind of physicalized story of what it is to be a slave. And so on my screen, I've got a, um, this am I not, uh, this, um, emblem that um, was used quite regularly in the 19th century, am I not a woman and a sister, which was taken, which was copied from um, Josiah Wedgwood, um, his emblem, am I not a man and a brother? And again, the, the, this image, this image of the, the supplicant, the enchained, the, the, the chained, the needy slave, which cuts into and denies this idea of an enslaved person like Mary Prince having a real vision of self having a real vision of purpose in spite of all, all the um, obstacles that are in front of her. Where did she get that vision from? Where were the, those role models? Where did she get this, 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 this resistance in her, in her to move forward when all it meant was that she would be punished over and over and over again? So, my word to you is when looking and reading Mary Prince, read it with these kind of features in mind that this was not meant for us. This story was not meant for us. It was shaped, Mary Prince's persona was shaped as a slave and reinforced as a slave. And I'm putting a word of caution that we should not take that as face value. I think I'm done. Hello. Hello. Hi. Okay, thanks, Ifemi. That's great. Um, we do have some questions, if you're okay to answer them. Mm. Um, bear with me. We've got some in the chat and we've got some in the Q&A box. So I'll just go through them. Um, so uh, we've got one here from James. He asks, uh, what were the risks for Mary Prince in speaking out? Okay. Now, I mean, she literally wore the risks on her person um, because there is a letter that's been, that was written, but in fact, I'll, I'll, I'll try and find it um, by, Margaret Pringle, um, Thomas Pringle's wife. And um, Margaret Pringle was inspecting um, Mary Prince's body just to see, almost like you needed this physical confirmation that what she said was true. And you can see the way that um, Margaret Pringle writes the letter that she is really disgusted and she, she literally stamps her own persona on. She says, I beg in reply to state that the whole part of her body is distinctly scarred and as it were checkered with the vestiges of severe floggings. So that was the risk. That was the risk, a constant um, threat of life, 
threat of physical punishment, just just the constant threat. And that's why I I I feel that he, she is even more phenomenal because she was aware of the risks and kept and still kept taking them. Mm. Okay, thank you for that question. Um, so we've got another one from Anonymous. Um, she uses particular men for her own game in order to be free, um, perhaps. Is that a fair assumption? Yes, yeah. Um, as I said, when, when we look at the data, there was a colored man called Adam White, who, who she was with for some months. There was a Mr. Burchill, who she had loaned money to. So there was always this kind of sense of monetary con um, contracts happening with Mary Prince, trying to negotiate, trying to save, to the point where she was lending money to men at times. And um, I don't want to be anachronistic about it and put it into the, tw it is not, it is not, that's what makes it phenomenal. At times, when we're looking at these stories, we're looking at them with a 21st century head. So we go, wow, isn't that fantastic? Oh, she's, she's using men and she's doing this and she's doing that. But this was 19th century, this was 157 years ago that mm -hmm. a lot of um, enslaved women used the resource, used what was available to them. And so, yeah, um, re relationships, um, with white men was, was, was one of the strategies, yeah. Um, uh, Barrington's made a comment, actually. Um, he says, please don't forget to explain the coloured man. Oh, <laughs> thank you. So, um, the kind of plantocracy system over the, uh, over the decades, over millennia, um, developed classes of people. And this is where the kind of pigmentocracy um, paradigm comes in. Um, white is at the top, um, colored, which, and it is a term that, that is used regularly within um, narratives. So I'm not apologizing, I'm, I'm trying to stick to terminology that, that is used, um, is, is, is what we would now um, class as mixed heritage. And in Antigua, there was a developing class, and I'm sure it was allowed to develop, of coloured peoples um, who socially were positioned in a way and afforded a few privileges. I've, I've got to be so careful because it was not always the case. This, 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 this period of enslavement is very, very complicated. So I've got to be careful. I can imagine somebody saying, oh, Fem said, um, oh, colored people were all free and everything was cool and blow up. That's not what I am saying. That said, definitely in Antigua, as well as other Caribbean countries, but my focus is Antigua because that's where Mary Prince um, spent the most of her adult life. And, and Britain, because Britain colonized and enslaved the West Indies. Um, yes, there was a colored class of people to the point where a number of colored men came to um, speak at committees in parliament. Um, so these were closed committees as to what would happen post, um, emancipation, post-slavery, well, you know, what, what, who, who was going to be, um, who was going to be the ruling class and so forth. So the coloured, um, I'm not surprised Mary Prince married um, Daniel James, who was coloured, um, because he was a man of means, and it, 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 it was a way of her marrying out of, um, the hardships of enslavement, if you like. Yes. Okay, uh, we've got quite a few questions if you're right to answer them, if I may. Okay. Um, okay, so another one here. Can you comment on interest in the core realization of being a slave? Many Windrus uh, Caribbean children, now adults, have told me that they knew not of racism until they came to England and racist slurs begin to happen and so forth. 
That's a real mixed bag mm. of a question. And I'm going to I'm going to kind of split it. And if I've gone off, remind me of the question again. There is an issue about African peoples, African Caribbean peoples in the diaspora. So that's away um, from the land of Africa or away from their homeland in the Caribbean. So when you're uh, living in the Caribbean and have grown up in the Caribbean, you're not aware of your blackness because it is not an issue, not in that respect anyway. There may be issues of pigmentocracy and so forth. And yes, it, 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 it is common that, that, that and it's, it's, yeah, that you're not aware of your blackness, but when you, get on a plane or get on a ship and come to say Europe, Europe and, and, and Britain, you are then racialized as black because you are now being reconstructed as part of the minority. Um, and it is, a, it, it is a shock for a lot of um, what we now, what is now labeled as Windrush people because it wasn't an issue in Jamaica. It wasn't an issue in Antigua, in Barbados. Then there may have been other issues, but not my blackness in that sense. So people then understand that, oh, suddenly I'm black or I'm being defined as black. And that black definition is diminutive. That black definition has a kind of hierarchical understanding. That black definition comes through Oh, oh, you're oh, very articulate for a black person or for a blah, blah, blah. And, and that's what the experience of, um, I think that's what that person's getting at. The realization of being a slave is, very, is slightly, mm, slightly different. It's, it's, it, that is very different. It's, it's just that, um, you know, when, when children were born into slavery, they were allowed some time because they weren't physically able to do, you know, to, 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 to join the gangs and, um, when I say gangs, I mean um, the field gangs and, and go out um, and, and toil in that sense. So, and as, as I said earlier, Mary Prince described that as the, the happiest time of her life. And we would be kind of thinking, well, how could that be? The, how could a slave ever be happy? But again, this is why we have to read these books for what they're saying and then read 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 the subtext so i don't have i answered that this is that that question is kind of convoluted because there's a racializes black when you come into a white dominated cultural country yeah or, or, or with with the culture and then there's the realization of being a slave which is slightly different Okay, uh, Barrington, I hope that's, um, that's answered your question. If not, then, then do pop a comment in uh, into the chat. Um, one from Bev here. Um, why did you choose to research Mary Prince? No disrespect, but she doesn't appear to have done anything of, of any huge significance. Wow. Mm. That's a really good one. But then, um, well, the text has survived a hundred and odd years. The text has given us, um, the, te the text could be, if, if you strip away the brutality, if you like, if you will, just, 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 just for a minute, the text could easily dovetail into the Me Too movement of women, despite, systemic hurdles overcoming them so i find the text inspirational and what i find inspirational about her is her personality and um yeah is the personality and that's why i'm saying um yeah she didn't do the underground thing but she wasn't in a place to you know people are it is where you you know where you find yourself you know the luck of the gods or what have you um and i think she's doing more for us now in terms of being an inspiration than um 
Yeah, so I think that's kind of unfair because I think this, this doing, and this is the thing about heroes and, you know, sheroes, it's about, oh, what has she done? Um, and for me, it's more, who was she being? Who, you know, her, her, her very essence speaks to me. That's why I'm interested in her. Her very essence speaks to me. I'm concerned about the way the, the media and Wikipedia and whatever media can then um, inflate her into something else that she's not. Oh, this is a heroine and she's done this and she's done that and she didn't. So I kind of hear that she didn't do the things that, you know, she, she didn't do the banners because she, you know, she wasn't in that place. She didn't do speeches because she wasn't, she wasn't literate. Um, but I think just being herself, because it, it, it was more trouble. You know, she gave her life more trouble by resisting um, being pushed down as a slave than, you know, than, than she needed to. And the massive irony for me with, with Mary Prince is a geographic one is that out of all the West Indian islands that, that Britain um, colonized, in 1834, um, when slavery ended, Antigua was the only island that went straight into, who did not have an apprentice, which didn't have an apprenticeship system. And the apprenticeship system was like slavery reinvented, or was slavery by another name. And um, yes, it's it's quite ironic. But yes, I I, I yeah. Okay, thank you for that. Um, so uh, this one from Beverly. Uh, you mentioned Pringle as a known editor, strongly associated with Prince. Are you aware of other editors or editions that were not by Pringle but are also on Prince herself? Um, and if so, how many how many of them are there? Okay, there are three editions all by Pringle within months, if not weeks of each other. So there, there are no others. It, it, is, it, 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 it is just um, Thomas Pringle. And again, I think it was happenstance how that happened because um, John Adams Wood was in that, that kind of Bloomsbury set and the um, Anti-Slavery Society was not too far away. So, the, the kind of closeness of location. So again, she was quite fortunate to be so close. It, it, it was a well-to-do area and she, she was fortunate to be in that area. But no, it, it, it's only um, three editions. And it's quite interesting how the editions happen because it, the editions don't always happen with, like now books are sold out and um, you, you have to do a reprint. Um, Thomas Pringle wanted to do a fourth edition, but didn't get, couldn't afford to do it. And the third edition of um, the history of Mary Prince has a number of different. Each edition has a number of different documents, and the third edition has that is the only edition with the letter from Margaret Pringle. Yeah. Okay, um, I guess that kind of brings me on to the next question. How would we know the real truth if it had to be edited first by Thomas Pringle, who may not have had a best interest um, as a priority? Open question. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. There, is, there, there, there are um, snippets of kind of a Creole register, but I think that they put that in just to make it sound a bit authentic, like lick, 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 and oh, my, oh what, 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 or, or, or what have you. So this has always been, and it, it, the issue about the truth, it's, it's such a twist for the 21st century because that's why the slave narratives came about to tell the truth about slavery in the 19th century. And now in the 21st century, we're actually saying what some of the 19th century naysayers were saying with a, but that can't be true, that's too exaggerated. I don't think this person is saying that, the questioner, but it's a moot question. 
Um, well, we, we've got to work with what we have. We've got to work with what, what we have. Um, and it's difficult. The only way to do that would be is, you know, intense work, looking through the archives, comparing notes. And there, there, there are quite a few. Um, I mentioned um, Sue Thomas, uh, there's Margaret McFadden, there's Jenny Sharp who have done that, but it, it's, it's heavy work to begin to compare the archives. And then again, the thing about the archives is the archives were managed by white men and so not everything is in the archives. Yeah, so it's a good question and we don't know. We, we don't know. There's something you, you read and you think, hmm, that's true. Um, you can hear my cynicism about the marriage, for instance. It, it reads like a Jane Austen, the beginning of one of Jane Austen's romances. Yeah, okay. Okay, um, I think we, we'll take one more question because I'm just really conscious of time and we have gone over. Um, Dr. Yuandi, uh, thank you for your exposition of Mary Prince, fascinating talk. Can you share a bit about what trajectory you intend to continue to explore in your research um, and what, what is fascinating or problematizing your research at the moment? What's problematizing my research is, is getting to the archives because there are times you can see um, It's a fragmentary nature of African history and African Caribbean histories. And um, as PhD scholars, you're meant to be as rigorous as you can. And I, I, I sometimes, just like I'm trying to encourage um, people to read between the lines because Mary Prince couldn't say I was raped. She had to say, I felt ashamed for my sins. Yeah, so there's a lot of encoding that goes on. And I, I, I think the trajectory is to, to consistently compare narratives. And the other part of my research is the epitextual, which is looking at newspaper cuttings um, and what they're saying. So yeah, I'll be, I'll, I'll be on that for, for, for quite some time. Yeah, just just excavating and excavating and excavating and thank you for that okay um dr yuan day again he says um i think it is important to learn about the history of everyday people um this history of below is an important methodology which has informed us about working class black women histories um, if there was no history from below, then we would only have a very partial history about the achievement of notable white men. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And I think it behoves us to, to really open up the spectrum of what we mean when we say histories. Um, I can hear colleagues of mine saying, oh, why are you doing slavery? Why are you doing slavery? Well, that is my personal professional choice. There's a span of histories out there in terms of peoples, black women that still need um, to be reviewed and looked at with a with, with a different eye, and it, and and it's and it's all it's it's all very fluid. So yeah, exciting times. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, we'll we'll wrap up as we have gone uh, over quite a bit. Um, a huge thank you, Ifamu. That was really superb. Um, thank you to everyone for submitting your questions and sorry if we weren't able to answer yours. Um, all of our Black History Month recordings can be found on our webpage. Uh, that's www.wlv.ac.uk forward slash Black History Month. Uh, we do have some wonderful art talks coming up. Our next one is Monday, the 8th of November at 7 p.m. Uh, that's with actress, singer, and session vocalist Sajja Kashwala on South Asian representation in musical theatre. So that proves to be quite interesting talk. Um, as always, you can book for free, free through Eventbrite. Thanks for watching. See you all soon. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much for coming and thanks for listening and sharing. Thank you. Bye bye, everyone. Bye.